I'm honored today to be joined by Pastor Mark Biltz, who is the founder of El Shaddai Ministries in Washington State. He is a well-known and popular commentator on the Feast of the Lord. He is also well-known for his discovery of the blood moon tetrads that shook the church community and changed our understanding of end-time prophecy. Mark has authored several best-selling books, including the one we're going to be talking today, which is Blood Moons, Decoding the Imminent Heavenly Signs. And Pastor, thank you for joining me here today. Well, thank you so much. I, I love being on your program with you. Well, we did a great show last week, and we were talking about the Antichrist, Decoding the Antichrist, one of your books, one of your excellent books. Now, you, as far as anyone that I've ever talked to, you're responsible for discovering the blood moon tetrads. And, you know, the book of Joel talks about blood moons. Jesus said there'd be signs in the sun, moon, and stars and all of that. But your book here, Blood Moons, Decoding the Imminent Heavenly Signs. How on earth did you find out about the blood moon tetras? <laughs> it was a miracle. It really was. I had to, I love astronomy. And so I was looking at the eclipses. And I had been praying, and it was actually, it happened, it hit me about four in the morning when I was in my prayer closet. I, I used to love to get up and pray around four and five in the morning, and I've been doing it for a long time. And uh, I also teach on the Feast of the Lord. And so all of a sudden it hit me, I need to go to NASA's website to look at when these eclipses are occurring on the biblical calendar. Uh, because in Genesis 1.14, many people misunderstand that verse, which is so significant. When we think of why did God create the sun and the moon, we think it was for light. But the Bible says the number one reason, go and look in Genesis 1.14, he created the sun and the moon for signs. And then it says for seasons. Well, the problem is English. When we read the word season, we think of winter, spring, summer, or fall. But that Hebrew word doesn't mean that. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus 23, when it talks about the Feast of the Lord, uh, that word feast, what do we think of when we think of feast? We think of food. Well, it's the same Hebrew word. So how can that Hebrew word, the same one, be translated as food here and winter in Genesis? It doesn't mean either one. It literally means an appointed time. That's why the biblical calendar for the Jewish people was based on the new moon, because it's on the new moon is the only time you can have a solar eclipse. And that's why the feasts like Passover and Tabernacles are on a full moon, because you can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. Hmm. So God's calendar isn't the Muslim calendar, the Gregorian calendar, it's the biblical calendar. And so I made that connection, and then I go back and I look, and you wouldn't believe it. The first blood moon happened on Passover. The next one was on Tabernacles. And there was a uh, solar eclipse on Rosh Hashanah, for heaven's sake, two weeks before the other lunar eclipse. And then in the next year, there also was a total lunar eclipse on Passover and Tabernacles. And I just was so shocked. I thought, well, how often does that happen? And I'd look, and the time it happened before was 1967 and 68 when Israel captured Jerusalem. And the time before that was when Israel became a nation, uh, 1949, 1950. And the time before that was 1492 when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain. And so uh, I just was blown away and I knew that it had to mean something. And I would never claim that I knew what it meant, but I knew it had great biblical significance. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's just... When, when I first read your book and began to understand the blood moons, you know, when you read Joel and it says there'll be the moon will be turned to blood, the sun will give its light, it's like, you know, the, the, the sky is going to fall. You know, I mean, but that's yeah. not what it's saying. No. It, it was saying that there will be signs, like Jesus said, in the sun, moon, and stars. And so the, the blood moon tetrads makes perfect sense because that's what God does. You know, it, <laughs> exactly. I mean, and he's he's so orderly, he's so predictable in that sense. So I, w I want you to talk about the the seasons because you were talking about the feast. Now, one of the things that you teach that is so fascinating is on the the feast of Israel. Okay, so you believe that the feast of Israel, seven feast, four in the spring, three in the fall. You believe that's a prophetic grid. You believe that that's a prophetic statement about the future, right? 
you are exactly right. In Revelation, it talks about those written in the book of the Lamb who's been slain from the foundation of the world, not 2,000 years ago. That means the slaying of the Passover Lamb was from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world. As a matter of fact, what I believe the Father said is, look, I'm going to send my son to die. I'm going to determine what day he's going to die. I'm going to determine what time he's going to die. As a matter of fact, I'm going to determine what songs will be sung at his funeral. Wow. This is why a thousand years before Jesus came, King David wrote the funeral hymns that would be sung on the day Yeshua died because every Passover they sing the Psalms, the Hallel. As a matter of fact, uh, many of your listeners know that they sang a hymn and went over to the Mount of Olives out on that night. I can tell you the words to the song they sang because they sang Psalm 118 uh, as the last hymn at every Passover Seder. So the very words that they sang before it was betrayed and crucified has the verse, this is the stone the builders have rejected. It's become the headstone of the corner. Oh, my gosh. So you have it's, you have Passover. So, yeah, yeah. And then you have unleavened bread. Right. Okay, which was the burial. Right. And then you have first fruits. Right, exactly, the resurrection. All of those have been fulfilled. On the day. On the day. On the very day. And then you have the Pentecost, which happened 50 days. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the Jewish... And yeah. so now those have been fulfilled, but now we have three that haven't been fulfilled. And right. so talk about the blood moons, talk about the significance of the next feast, because we, we were talking about the last program. This next Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, could be very significant. Talk about that. Oh, very significant. Now, if, if your listeners believe the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, not just in their head, but in their heart. They know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he fulfilled the spring feast to the day of his first coming, he'll fulfill the fall feast to the day of his second coming, right. which is why we need to know when they occur on our calendar. And just like you can't have Pentecost until he rose from the dead. He's not going to rise from the dead until he's buried. And they're not going to bury him until he died. They're going to be fulfilled in order. So the next feast to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. Well, do we hear anything about trumpets in Revelation? Of course we do. Mm -hmm. And so the next feast, Yom Kippur, is Israel's National Day of Atonement, the very day when their blinders will be removed. They'll realize Yeshua is the Messiah. And then the next feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, where God tabernacles among men for the thousand-year reign. Now, the Feast of Trumpets, which is the very next one to be fulfilled, okay, it's also known as Yom Teruah, or the Day of the Awakening Blast. That's right. There's all kinds of scriptures that prove the resurrection of the dead, the rapture, if you want to call it that, will happen on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, some year. We don't know the year. Some year. We don't. I don't set dates. I don't know what year. See, I, I have no idea. But I know what will happen on Rosh Hashanah some year. Well, I totally agree with that. And see, and the thing is, for years I heard that Jesus could come at any time. Well, he couldn't die at any time. Exactly. See, exactly. He had to die on Passover. Right. And so to say that the rapture could, ha the rapture could happen any year. Yes, and, there you and, go. And because it's a two-day feast, it could happen any, any of the days. You know, well, a, a, not only that, it's two different days every day in the world. Yeah. We have 24 time zones. How can anyone know the day or the hour when there's at any one time there's 24 different hours? Well, that's why Jesus said, Luke 17, in that day, there'll be two men in, or in that night, two men be one, one bed, two people in one bed, one taken, one left. In that day, there'll be two right. men standing in a field because it'll be night some places and day some places. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So some, and it's going to happen around September. That's the, that's the yep. English uh, here. But around September of the year, there's going to be the, the Feast of Trumpets, and there's going to be the, the rapture, the resurrection of the dead. Now, you, you, and there are also other names that you talk about when you talk about, uh, you know, Yom Trua, the, you know, the Wakening Blast, all this stuff, but also it's the wedding day of the Messiah. 
Yes, uh, it's also the coronation of the Messiah. It's the day he's going to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in Leviticus 23, these feasts were called convocations, which in Hebrew is mikra, which literally means a dress rehearsal. So I ask people, do you want to be at the wedding of the lamb? And they go, yes. I say, then why don't you want to be at the dress rehearsal? That's where we learn our part. Yeah. That's amazing. So let me go back to 2014 and 15 because we're talking about the blood moons. Sure. Uh, very, very. Th this is just such a significant point in time in human history that we're we're looking at. And, and what I say to people, Pastor, is, you know, every generation has had a sign or signs. You know, Hitler was there, earthquakes, wars, but we're the only generation that has all the signs. We, exactly. We have a convert, especially Israel, but we have a convergence of all the signs. So, uh, so going back to uh, Christopher Columbus, who was a Jew, and many people don't know that, but uh, here's the way I've seen the blood moons because there's 1492, 1493, 1949, 1950, 1967, 1968, and then 2014 and 15. So we understand the first three, but here's the way that I look at it. The, the 1492 and 1493 was the beginning of God bringing his holy people together. This is the first time since the uh, AD 70 that we see the first beginnings of a gathering there. 14, or 1949, 1950 is the Holy Land. Uh, the, the Jews get back the Holy Land. 1967, 1968 is the Holy City of yes. Jerusalem. 2014-2015 is that's the one to me is the holy temple um, there has been the since in the last three months there's been 11,000 Jews ascend the temple mount to pray the most since 2,000 years ago okay and so we're seeing a, a great uh, activity in Jerusalem the Temple Institute the Temple Mount oh, yeah. faithful different people so what do you think about the feast of 2014 and 15? What do they mean? Does, is it is it significant for the sure. temple? Does it have any other significance? I think it definitely could be temple related. The way I look at it from hindsight, I did mention this back then as well. But if you remember Joseph's dream, and Joseph was a type of the Messiah, there was seven years of plenty followed by the seven years of famine. I believe the 2014-2015 lunar uh, tetrad was a warning of the seven-year cycle. When it ended, we would begin the seven-year famine or tribulation, oh, which wow. is why 2022 is so significant. Okay, so the uh, Shemitahs, and if you wouldn't mind talking about it again. So now, this is a Shemitah year that we're in right now. Yes. Uh, now, when we say 2021, 2022, the Jewish year begins and their their uh, civil year begins uh, the Rosh Hashanah. Yes. In September. Yes. Okay. So their their new year began in September, and so now between now and next September, this is a Shemitah year. This is the seventh year. Yes. And and you believe now uh, again that the tribulation has to begin at the beginning of a Shemitah cycle, which is next September. Exactly. And I have a chart here. One of the things that I want to mention is how significant the first year of a Shemitah cycle is, and which will begin uh, October of next year, you know, right after Rosh Hashanah, because we're in the seventh year. But did you know both temples, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and Rome destroyed the temple, both in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Wow. So both temples were destroyed then. The 1967 Six-Day War happened in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The Yom Kippur War happened in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Uh, Israel took out the Iraq nuclear reactor in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The first intifada was in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The Israel-Jordan peace treaty was the first year of a Shemitah cycle. That's when the quartet began that wanted to divide the land. And I believe they represent the four horns in Zechariah that keep the land divided. Uh, and then the Gaza war and, of course, the stock market crash also happened the first year of a Shemitah cycle. And then we have the 2014-2015 blood moons, which was the end of a Shemitah cycle going into the beginning of a Shemitah cycle. And one other point I want to make, 
you could only blow the shofar on the year of Juba in the year of Jubilee. Now you got to remember, there's 49 years or seven cycles. The first, the year of Jubilee is always the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. Right. Well, 1973, Yom Kippur War, Yom Kippur is the day they blow the shofar announcing the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. And then we have the Yom Kippur War. Well, I believe that was probably a Jubilee year, which means next year also is a Jubilee year. Oh, my gosh. So what is so you believe if the tribulation does not begin next year, it has to wait till the next meter cycle. Exactly. It has to begin because Daniel's Jewish. Sure. Okay. Well, too often Christians see the seven year time period, they know, but it's not any random year. It can't start today. It can't start, you know, on any Rosh Hashanah. It has to begin the first year of a Shemitah cycle. So, so the next year being the beginning of a Shemitah cycle and Jubilee. Exactly. I mean, that's huge. just huge. This is huge. Yeah. And so and you, when you when you talk about the the Shemitah year, you're you're going by the Jewish calendar, of course. And yes. the way we know it's a Shemitah year is the Hebrew year is divisible by seven. It's really simple. Yeah, yeah. And I heard you say that one time, and it embarrassed me. It was it was so simple. I was like, why didn't I think of that? But so next year is a huge, huge year, and that's what huge. you're saying. Yeah. I tell you what, you're the, all your listeners need to get ready. I have a very special announcement, and that is I've been telling you for a while that we have a new book coming out that's called Where Are the Missing People? And it's a book that you leave behind for people who are left behind after the rapture. This is something that would tell them what just happened. It, It explains the rapture to them. It leads them to the Lord. It tells them how to uh, be baptized, how to, you know, read the word of God, how to, you know, navigate the end times the things that are happening in the world during the tribulation, the things that are going to happen. It literally is just a survival guide for people who have been left behind and are living during the tribulation. I know you have family members and friends and just people maybe that you don't know, but they're going to be going through your stuff. If you're a Christian and you have been raptured, they're going to be in your home, they're going to be in your office, they're going to be in your car. And we want to give you the opportunity to have this book that you can have laying around that says, where are the missing people? That's where the the number one question that's going to be on people's minds after the rapture is, where are the missing people? Where where all those people go? So this is a book that you can prominently display, uh, and it's an attractive book that you can prominently display in your home, in your office, in your bedroom, in your car, wherever you want to put it, to where people would be able to find it uh, after the rapture and during the tribulation to lead them to the Lord and give them instruction on how to navigate those unbelievably difficult days. Now, if you're a subscriber to endtimes.com, we're going to give you a free ebook. Okay, you don't have to pay anything for it. We'll give you a free ebook, Where Are the Missing People? If you'd like a physical copy of the book, it's missingpeoplebook.com, and you can order a copy or copies there. If you're not a subscriber, you can go to missingpeoplebook.com. Get a copy, get three, get eight, and give them, lay them around. Lay them around your house, your apartment, you know, wh- wherever you want to put them. Uh, and just to make sure that you have those represented where people will be after the rapture. And so this is something we're very excited about because, you know, honestly, it's just if we leave and don't leave a message behind for those people who are left behind, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's not right because. We know that there's going to be billions of people left behind after the rapture. So for every believer who is thinking about people who are left behind, this is a great opportunity. If you're a subscriber, free ebook, you can get the physical copies, missingpeoplebook.com. If you're not a subscriber, you can buy as many of the copies as you want, missingpeoplebook.com. But we're very excited. This book is just about to come out. You can pre-order it right now, missingpeoplebook.com. As soon as... 